Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I would like to talk to you about spinning up asteroids to make asteroid bases. Okay, this is a bit of a sci-fi trope that's quite common. The latest update to Elite Dangerous Horizons actually includes a number of space stations, which are in fact hollowed out asteroids that have been spun up to provide gravity. And my favourite TV show of the moment, the Expanse also features a number of prominent locations, or at least two prominent locations, Ceres and Eros, which are again asteroids which have been hollowed out and spun up to provide gravity for the people living there. So I decided to actually go and do the math on this and figure out whether it's possible. What kind of energy would it take to spin up an asteroid? And would an asteroid even hold together if you did this? Well, the answer to the latter question is actually pretty obviously no. In fact, there's been a recent paper published that uh, looks at an object discovered in 2013, which was multiple asteroids traveling in small, close formation. Originally, they thought it was a comet, but after they investigated it, it turned out that it was more a number of small asteroidal bodies. And these thing, this asteroid had been breaking up slowly over time. It wasn't one big breakup event that you would have expected if there was a collision. Instead, it was a progressive breakup that occurred over months. And the theory is that this breakup occurred because the asteroid began to spin faster and faster and eventually spun itself apart. Now, the wise people out there might be wondering, what could cause a chunk of rock in space to spin faster and faster? And the answer is something called the Yarkovsky O'Keefe Radvyezsky Paddock effect, which astronomers like to call the YORP effect because it's a whole lot easier. So this is actually a, it's it's an interesting effect. It's all to do with the way that photons carry momentum, carry light, uh, carry pressure. As you know, you, radiation pressure from the sun can be used by, say, a solar sail to push an object around. Well, the solar radiation from the sun also hits asteroids and planets. And with small asteroids, well, you could imagine that the small amount of radiation from the sun hitting it and being reflected could provide some thrust towards the asteroid. The thing is, though, that uh, radial, that thrust from the asteroid or from the sun is pretty much radial. It's lined up with the gravity vector, so all it does is essentially reduce the gravitational force very much. And as it turns out, if you do the math, this doesn't change the orbit very much. But a smart guy called Ivan Yarkovsky, he realized that the asteroids were rotating. And as, the, as one side of the asteroid was in daylight, the surface would be warmed up. It would get hotter and hotter. And then as the asteroid rotated and that section of the surface passed onto the night side of the planet, of the minor planet, that it would start to cool down. It would be emitting thermal radiation. And that thermal radiation would carry off momentum. Now, because the peak of this emission essentially occurs just after sunset or around sunrise or sunset on the object, that meant that the force applied by that was perpendicular to the force of gravity. So it could actually be providing a continuous small prograde or retrograde burn. And as any Kerbal Space Program player will tell you, the prograde and retrograde burns are the ones that really change the orbit over time. So the Yarkovsky effect, this combination of heating, rotation and re-emission, can actually significantly alter the orbit of an asteroid over time. The YARP effect takes this and says, well, maybe it's not a spherical asteroid, maybe it's a non-spherical asteroid with different levels of albedo, and they showed that it's possible for an asteroid that is being continuously heated by the sun to re-emit the radiation in such a way that it accelerates or it changes its spin state. And for a small asteroid, may 100 meters or so across, it can spin up from zero to above its gravitational breakup speed in under a million years. And that's what's believed to have happened with this small asteroid. Asteroids in the asteroid belt, they do occasionally have small impacts. They uh, are perhaps parts of larger bodies, but it's believed that many of them are rubble piles. They're not solid chunks of rock. They have big cracks running through them. Some of them are just collections of piles of dust and dirt that are barely held together. So if you 
tried to spin one of these up and make a base out of it, it would fly apart. Of course, in the stories of uh, Elite and in uh, The Expanse, the people that do this, they find solid asteroids and then they engineer them. The suggestion is that you would heat these up, melt them, and then they would solidify into one giant mass. And that would, in theory, hold them together. Except it wouldn't. So let's do the math for the Expanse. Let's start with Eros, since that was the first asteroid supposedly colonized by Tycho Corporation. Now Eros is interesting because it was uh, one of the asteroids which came very, is a main belt asteroid which came very close to the Earth. And in fact, it's one of the few main belt asteroids which under the right circumstances could potentially be viewed by the naked eye and certainly could be seen if you have binoculars. It comes in from the main belt, gets very close to Earth and then goes back out uh, with a certain periodicity. In fact, it comes so close to the Earth that uh, back in the 1900s, during an early opposition, there was a concerted campaign by astronomers to try and measure the parallax between one side of the Earth and the other to see if they could measure the size of the solar system. And they got a good estimate of the size of the solar system based upon this. Eros was also one of the first asteroids to be studied extensively for, for a long period of time. It was the target of the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous mission, later renamed to Near Shoemaker. This was a spacecraft which went, it visited, it, it orbited the asteroid and studied it, got detailed maps. And then, as the mission was coming to the end, the, the people in charge decided to go one better and they actually landed the spacecraft on the surface of the asteroid. This spacecraft was not designed to land. Amazingly, it was still operational, so they decided to lift it off and land somewhere else again, just to show how badass those pilots were. So the asteroid Eros is small enough that it has not collapsed into a sphere. It uh, is about a beaten kind of shape. It's uh, 11 kilometers on the short axis by about 34 kilometers on the long axis. And if you wanted to, say, spin this around the long axis, or sorry, around the short axis, and uh, get 0.3 g on those, the tips of the long axis to match Martian gravity, you would have to spin this at about 0.75 degrees per second. It would take about eight minutes to rotate. That is a whole lot faster than its current five and a quarter hour rotation. So for an object of this shape, you can estimate the moment of inertia and figure out how much force over time it would take to spin this up. You could imagine the Tycho engineers taking the magical, super-powered, high-tech Epstein drives used in the TV show, attaching them to the ends of the asteroid and using that to accelerate it up to speed. It would take something like 16 Saturn V's worth of thrust firing at the tips for 10 years to spin Eros up to this size. Partly this is because Eros is mostly rock. It has a lot of mass and it's not like a lightweight empty space station which is mostly air. This is full of solid rock. So in the Expanse universe, it's clear that they have lots of energy at their disposal and uh, since they're able to generate these with the, the Epstein drive, you could probably get enough energy to melt the top kilometer or so of an asteroid like Eros. But then you'd be faced with the problem that it would literally take centuries to cool down. You would have to have some sort of active cooling system pumping the heat around. And then, well, it probably still wouldn't be strong enough. It turns out that rock, even when you make a monolithic chunk of rock, isn't particularly good when it comes to strength to weight ratio. And that's what's important. In engineering, you have the notion of something called the self-support length. That's a combination of the mass and the strength of the object. The way to imagine this is if you have like a cable of a particular material and you make it longer and longer and longer, eventually it gets so long that the weight of the cable will snap the cable. And it turns out that things like aluminium are actually better than stronger materials like steel because the steel weighs so much more. Now with rock, 
Rock is actually made up of lots of different minerals, and if you melt it and let it solidify, you get lots of these little crystals that form into a matrix. The individual crystals are actually very, very strong, but the boundaries between these crystals are very likely to form fractures, and under the kind of stress you would expect on this scale, the asteroid would literally break apart. However, there is something called basalt fibre. The basalt fibre is a bit like glass fibre, but it's made using rock. Uh, you, you basically make little fibres of rock, little threads of material out, which you then bind together with epoxy, and you get a very, very strong material, which has a self-support length that is sufficient to handle something of the size of Eros. Problem is, of course, this isn't simply melting and letting something re-solidify. It is a much more involved process, which involves not just melting, but processing, and then somehow binding the stuff together with a strong material, a strong matrix that allows the fibres to hold together relative to each other. So, yeah, in theory, something the size of Eros could borderline be made to work, assuming you came up with a fancy material processing, which is no doubt Tyco Corporation's trade secret. But Ceres, well, Ceres, that is a different matter. Ceres is way bigger. Its radius is something like 470 kilometers. It's like 100,000 times more massive. Now, it would only need to rotate at about 2.5 milliradians per second, uh, or about 0.144 degrees per second. Actually, it would have to rotate slightly faster because the mass of Ceres means that it has about 3% of Earth's gravity. At that size, you pretty much, there's no materials that can be made from those rocks. If you want to have a 400 kilometer sized object which is made of solid material, the only way you're going to get it spinning and supporting itself is using something like carbon nanotubes. Just imagine Tycho have come up with some magical way to make series hold together. What would it take to actually spin it up? Well, you know, you can do the math again for an object of that size and that mass, and it turns out that uh, the amount of torque you need is about 6.7 times 10 to the 20 newton meters. If you put all your rocket engines at the surface, then uh, it, the, uh, it turns out that you need about 40 million Saturn V equivalents, which um, is quite a lot. If you remember my video on calculating the efficiency of the, Ep the Epstein drive, I figured out that the prototype drive that Solomon Epstein may have used could have been as powerful as one-fifth of a Saturn V. So, yeah, 200 million prototype Sol uh, Epstein drives could spin up series to the relevant speeds in a decade. But... Why would you do that? Wouldn't, I, I think I could come up with far more interesting things to do with 200 million spacecraft than spin up a large chunk of rock. It really it doesn't make sense except to have a cool setting in a TV show or in a book. And you know, sure, that does make sense. But uh, you know, I always felt when I read about Ceres Station that really it made much more sense to have a station which is spinning, which is near to Ceres, perhaps it's in orbit around Ceres, perhaps even it is a, an artificial gravity system sitting on the surface spinning around while the rest of the asteroid remains normal, because that would make far more sense. Why spin up an asteroid when it's going to make it so much harder for spacecraft to dock? I don't know. Sci-fi, we love the cool ideas, but sometimes we don't think them through before writing them down. Anyway, yeah, hope you found this interesting. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.